Here, we're going to discuss a paper that was published in Nature in July of 2014. It's titled, Engineering a Memory with LTD and LTP. The techniques used in this study are going to bring almost everything that you've learned in this course together into a coherence. The basic idea of the study is to show that memories are encoded by modifications of synaptic strength through cellular mechanisms of long-term potentiation, abbreviated LTP, and long-term depression, abbreviated LTD. The first step was to condition mice to associate a foot shock with optogenetic stimulation of auditory inputs targeting the amygdala. And the amygdala is a brain region known to be essential for fear conditioning, a type of associative memory. But before describing the experiments, I will first show how the auditory portions of the brain were transfected with channel rhodopsin 2, abbreviated CHR2. Second, I will illustrate the basic paradigm the investigators used for fear conditioning. And then I will discuss how the above techniques were used to show that long-term potentiation, LTP, and long-term depression, LTD, were critical mechanisms that underlie the memory for fear conditioning. For optogenetic studies, investigators insert channel rhodopsin-2 genes into brain cells with an engineered virus. The channel rhodopsin-2 gene is fused with a gene for a red fluorescent protein TD tomato. I'll just hereafter refer to it as tomato. Investigators can then trigger neural activity on demand with flashes of blue light, and tomato allows them to see the transfected neurons in tissue slices that were sectioned following the experiment. Here, the channel rhodopsin 2 and tomato genes are fused with a promoter for synapsin, which is constitutively active in neurons. The modified gene is inserted into a virus, which is then injected into a mouse's brain, where the channel rhodopsin 2 and tomato are expressed in the transfected neurons. Recall that channel rhodopsin 2 is a microbial rhodopsin that has a pore permeable to sodium ions. The pore opens when stimulated with blue light, thereby exciting neurons and causing them to generate action potentials. The area of the brain that we're going to be concerned with is a region called the amygdala. This is a region of the forebrain next to the hippocampus that is known to be essential for fear conditioning. Here we're looking at a cross-section of a mouse's brain, and you can see the amygdala in the lower right. The amygdala receives inputs from many different brain regions, but two are especially important for this study. The first are the auditory inputs from the auditory cortex and from the medial geniculate, the auditory thalamus. The second are inputs that are activated by foot shock, shown here in purple. The investigators are going to transfect the auditory inputs to the amygdala with channel rhodopsin 2. This is accomplished with electrodes filled with a viral construct containing the genes for channel rhodopsin 2 and tomato. The constructs are then injected into the auditory cortex and into the medial geniculate. Several days following the injection, axons from the auditory system express channel rhodopsin 2 and the tomato. Notice the only axons expressing the channel rhodopsin 2 are the axons from the auditory cortex and the medial geniculate. The axons activated by shock do not express the channel rhodopsin 2 because they are not transfected. Next, a light guide that can be activated by a laser is inserted into the amygdala.
When a light guide is activated by blue light, the blue light activates the channel rhodopsin and evokes action potentials in the axons from the auditory cortex and medial geniculate. Watch. The transfected neurons can be driven rapidly with high-frequency light flashes, which will be used to generate long-term potentiation. And just as a reminder, long-term potentiation is generated by a high calcium influx through NMDA receptors, which then triggers the additional insertion of AMPA channels into the synapse and the phosphorylation of the channels, which increases their conductance. Recall that long-term depression, or LTD, is generated by a low calcium influx, which causes some of the AMPA receptors to be sequestered from the synapse and the dephosphorylation of the remaining receptors, thereby reducing their conductance. Thus, auditory fibers can be driven with very low rates of light flashes. The low rates cause only a small calcium influx into the amygdala and thus can be used to generate long-term depression. Okay, so we have considered the basic conditions and the main features of the brain that are of importance to this study. We now turn to fear conditioning and the baseline data of the study. The first thing the investigators did was to train mice to press a bar to receive a liquid reward. Now it comes to fear conditioning. So while the mouse is bar pressing, a tone is occasionally presented and a shock is delivered to the mouse's feet while the tone is on. This is called the paired condition, paired because the tone is paired with the shock. So the mouse is pressing the bar, receiving a liquid reward, all of a sudden the tone comes on. And then the mouse is shocked while the tone is still on. The mouse then freezes and stops pressing the bar. The mouse quickly learns to associate the tone with the shock. After the pairing of tone and shock, the mouse is tested the next day, but only with the tone. Now whenever the tone comes on, the mouse freezes and stops pressing the bar. So here he is the next day, pressing the bar for a liquid reward. The tone comes on, and the tone causes the mouse to freeze and stop pressing the bar, even though no shock is presented. The data obtained in the following day is plotted as a graph. Time in minutes is plotted on the x-axis. The number of bar presses is plotted on the y-axis and the time when the tone comes on is shown in green. This summarizes the results obtained for the paired condition. If the tone and the shock are not presented at the same time, but rather the shock is presented about a minute following the tone, the tone does not become associated with the shock. Now the mouse does not stop bar pressing when the tone comes on. This is called the unpaired condition. And here it is. The mouse is pressing the bar. The tone comes on. It continues to press the bar. About a minute later, a shock is delivered, but no tone is presented. The mouse now freezes and stops pressing the bar. When the mouse is tested the next day, the mouse continues to bar press for a liquid reward even when the tone comes on. The mouse does not freeze. This data is shown and plotted as a graph on the right 
and it's called the unpaired condition. Instead of coupling a tone with a shock, optical stimulation of the auditory fibers innervating the amygdala are coupled with shock. Here the mouse is pressing a bar for a liquid reward. The optogenetic stimulation and shock are paired. The mouse freezes and stops pressing the bar. When the mouse is tested on the next day, the optogenetic stimulation by itself evokes freezing. And that's plotted on the right as the paired condition for optogenetic stimulation. As was the case with the unpaired tone and shock, if the optogenetic stimulation and shock are not presented at the same time, but rather the shock is presented a minute following the optogenetic stimulation, the stimulation does not become associated with the shock. When the mouse is tested on the next day, it does not stop bar pressing when the optogenetic light comes on. The basic idea is that pairing a tone or optogenetic stimulation with shock strengthened the synapses made by auditory fibers on amygdala neurons. Those synapses there. The strengthening should be expressed as long-term potentiation in amygdala neurons, but only in the mice that had experienced the paired conditions. Long-term potentiation should not be expressed in the mice that experienced the unpaired condition. The way they evaluated long-term poten potentiation is from a brain slice. That is, they anesthetized a mouse, removed its brain, sliced the brain into thin sections, and put the sections in a dish. The slice would look like the brain section in the left half of the slide. The brain is still alive, and they could record from amygdala neurons in the slice. This is a modified drawing of a brain slice and shows fibers transfected with channel rhodopsin from the auditory cortex, the transfected fibers from the medial geniculate, and the fibers activated by shock, which are not transfected with channel rhodopsin. The slice is from a mouse that had experienced unpaired optical stimulation and thus did not express fear when optical stimulation of the amygdala was presented alone, as shown on the graph on the right. Next, the investigators patched on to the amygdala cell and recorded in whole cell mode. With whole cell recordings, the membrane of the neuron is sucked into the lumen of the electrode, which allows for intracellular recordings, as shown in the top left of the slide. Voltage clamp recordings can now be made from the amygdala neurons. Recall that voltage clamp means that the membrane potential is fixed, that it is clamped at some value and is not allowed to change. When the fibers innervating the neuron are activated and release transmitter onto the amygdala neuron, the transmitter opens ligand-gated channels, allowing current to flow into the neuron. It is the amount of current flowing into the neuron that is measured in voltage clamp mode. A blue light source activated by a laser is placed over the brain slice. The membrane of the the membrane potential of the amygdala neuron is then clamped at minus 60 millivolts. When the blue light is turned on, the light causes the transfected axons from the auditory cortex and medial geniculate to fire, thereby releasing transmitter onto the amygdala. The inward positive current carried by sodium is then measured and shown above the slice in the blue trace labeled inward current at minus 60 millivolts. The membrane potential is then changed and clamped at plus 40. When the light is again turned on, a current flowing outward is recorded and is shown as the red trace. Another recording is then made from a neuron. 
but this time the slice was from a mouse that had experienced paired optical stimulation and thus had expressed fear when optical stimulation of the amygdala was presented alone. Current records are then obtained from this neuron when the membrane potential was clamped at minus 60 millivolts and at plus 40. The investigators then derived a ratio of the current from AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. The way they derived this ratio is not apparent, and I explained how they could obtain these ratios in the supplementary section at the end of the movie. For now, just accept that these could be made. The significance of the ratios is that LTP adds AMPA receptors to the synapse at the postsynaptic cell. Those. Hence, long-term potentiation adds AMPA receptors, and a cell that has undergone LTP should have more current flowing through the AMPA receptors than NMDA receptors, and that ratio should be larger than in a cell that has not undergone LTP. And this is indeed the finding. The ratio of AMPA to NMDA current is about 2 in naive mice, that is, mice that have never experienced any kind of pairing or any kind of situation, and in unpaired mice. Whereas in paired mice, the ratio of AMPA to NMDA currents is more than double that of the unpaired, just a little more than 4. So the conclusion. The pairing of shock and optogenetic stimulation causes long-term potentiation in amygdala neurons. Moreover, the synaptic strengthening expressed as LTP is a critical feature that causes the mice, which previously were subjected to the pairing of optogenetic stimulation and shock, to freeze and experience fear when optogenetic stimulation alone is subsequently presented. Okay. We have all the basic information now, and now we're going to come to the really, really cool stuff. And the questions that the authors investigated was, can memories be inactivated? In other words, if long-term potentiation occurred at the optically driven synapses of the amygdala, as they just showed that they were, and if this long-term potentiation really contributed to the fear memory, then reversing the long-term potentiation with long-term depression should inactivate the memory. So they're going to take mice that previously experienced the paired condition with optical stimulation, and they're going to generate long-term depression in the amygdala with low frequency optical stimulation, like this. Watch. One day after optical long term depression was generated, the mice were tested with optical stimulation and showed no fear. This indicated inactivation of the memory of the shock that was originally established by long-term potentiation. But can the fear memories be reactivated? The same mice were then given a long-term potentiation protocol with high-frequency light stimulation to the amygdala and then tested for fear on the following day. This is the way high-frequency light stimulation was generated. It should reverse the long-term depression that was previously generated in the amygdala, and indeed it did. When they were tested the next day, there was fear. Fear memories can be inactivated and reactivated multiple times in the same mouse. So this is the paired condition, that is the original testing one day after pairing, that evoked fear. Then you generate LTD, and there's no fear. Then you generate long-term potentiation, and there is fear. And then you can generate long-term depression in the same mouse, and there's no fear again. And then you can reactivate it by generating long-term potentiation the second time and evoke fear. 
the inactivation and reactivation of a fear memory with optogenetic stimulation is very cool. Finally, high frequency optical stimulation alone does not evoke fear. The optical stimulation must have previously been paired with shock. So, for example, you can take a naive mouse here and give high frequency optical stimulation. There are no shocks associated with it. You test them the next day, and there's no fear. You take the same mouse, and you pair the high-frequency optical stimulation with a shock, and voila, the next day, there is fear. Since optical stimulation only excites auditory fibers, it is not surprising that high-frequency optical stimulation of the auditory fibers by itself does not evoke fear. If the sole criterion for evoking fear were a high rate of auditory activity, fear would be evoked after hearing every loud sound. To be effective, the optical stimulation must have previously been paired with shock. The initial pairing of shock and optical stimulation evokes coordinated firing of the auditory and shock-sensitive fibers that both innervate the amygdala. So the main conclusions of this study are first, a fear memory can be generated in the amygdala by optogenetic stimulation paired with shock. The fear memory evoked by optogenetic stimulation in the amygdala can be inactivated by long-term depression and reactivated by long-term potentiation. And three, these results confirm the hypothesis that memories are encoded by modifications of synaptic strength through the cellular mechanisms of long-term potentiation and long-term depression.